Hello book lovers, and welcome to a very different type of video from Lost Between the Pages. Alright, I'm not gonna keep up that voice, I don't think. In my senior year of college, I wrote a paper about the transformation of the vampire figure. This is an adapted version, obviously, since an actual paper would be slightly boring. The transformation of the vampire figure from Dracula to Twilight corresponds to a shift in audience, from the sole male gaze to a more contemporary female gaze. Dracula was written in a male-dominated society, emphasizing the idealized male hero with the objectified female that the men need to protect from the demonic vampire. A more modern rendition of vampire lore is Twilight, which was written for a young female audience to fulfill their romantic and sexual desires, with a vampire as the main love interest, not the antagonistic predator. The shift to Twilight's portrayal of the vampiric figure can be seen in intermediary stages in two cinematic predecessors, Dracula in 1931 and Bram Stoker's Dracula in 1992. Since the fictional vampire figure is, and always will be, a vehicle for unnatural desire, the shift in audience also affected the portrayal of the human characters as they expressed their desire. Human masculine desire changes from being redemptive and heroic to something commonplace and unexciting. Feminine desire is originally portrayed as monstrous and something that needs to be suppressed, but eventually it becomes more active and open. In the original novel, Dracula, Bram Stoker creates black and white characters that are either fully good or fully evil. It follows the story of a group of heroic men as they fight and slay the monster Dracula. The vampires... The vampires are portrayed as inhuman creatures that want to infect and threaten the entire world with their villainy. Dracula plans on doing this by attacking the women who are weaker and better able to transform the men later. The calculating, inhuman, immortal, completely evil monster who can only be destroyed by men's wit and brawn. He is given qualities that separate him from humanity, such as the fact that he cannot go out into daylight, is afraid of crucifixes, he must sleep in a coffin in the soil from his home country, he cannot be seen in reflective surfaces, and he can turn into a bat. The male fantasy is played out and honored because Stoker was writing for a primarily male audience and indulged in their fantasies. The fantasy of being a knight in shining armor, slaying the monster, and saving the girl. The women in Dracula, Mina and Lucy, are initially portrayed as vehicles for the men to be heroic and they lack identity outside of the men's desire for them and their desire for relationship with the men. Women were not allowed to show desire during this time. Instead, they were supposed to channel any and all passions into moral and domestic aspirations. In Stoker's novel, the women's role is to be an angel in the house, which means that she is supposed to support the men, becoming a moral, yielding, and domestic paragon. When the women fail at being the moral center, they fail at being a human female which often leads to their becoming a vampire. And if they did express sexual desires, like Lucy, they were labeled as unnatural and monstrous. Lucy, after expressing sexual desire for men, is soon turned into a vampire. The vampire is the vehicle through which the women can express their sexuality, but it is seen as unnatural and monstrous. Mina, on the other hand, does not express any sexual longing, even for her husband. Her desires line up with the Victorian ideal. She only wants to help her husband and to be a good wife. Yet when Dracula attacks her, she becomes unclean and must be saved by the heroic men. The human male's desire is shown as redemptive for those same women. When Lucy becomes a vampire, the act of her fiancé piercing her with a phallic stake redeems her. Sexually alive in the coffin, Lucy's body shook and quivered and twisted in violent contortions. Her fiancé drove deeper and deeper the mercy-bearing stake into her chest. Her unnatural desire is tamed by a lawful sexual encounter with her fiancé while she is sleeping in a coffin. The male sexual experience is validated while the female is otherized, making it impossible for women of this time to express themselves. The male Victorian audience of this book would have validated this line of thinking, only seeing it through their male gaze. The female population was repressed, and the possibility of having a female gaze or readership during this time would have been ignored. Thirty years after the book, in the 1931 film Dracula, the vampire is still shown as a conduit of unnatural desire, but he is more humanized. 
He visits the human's house on a social visit and goes to the opera. He has a suave sophistication that is missing from the original novel. He is an idealized male figure of this time period, attractive and rich. This Dracula is portrayed as more animalistic in his desires. His desire for blood is more of an instinct that he cannot control rather than a choice to be malicious. He is, however, still a figure of unnatural desire and a villain because he still rapes Lucy and Mina by sucking their blood while they are asleep or in a trance. The fulfillment of this on screen could be seen as a rape fantasy, an unnatural desire that the audience tries to suppress. He still retains some of the othering qualities originally given by Bram Stoker, such as that he cannot be seen in reflective surfaces and he cannot go out in daylight and he can turn into a bat. In this movie, the male gaze is still prominent since the male characters are the only active ones. The men are the ones who control and lead the women and male desire is again seen as pure and redemptive. They want to protect the women physically as well as protect the ideals of the women's sexuality. As for the female desire, it is again demonized and pushed aside. Whenever the women are on screen, they always have the shadow, the idea, or the physical presence of a man influencing them. The women are surrounded by men, and when they are alone with each other, they only talk about men. In the 1931 movie, Lucy mentions an attraction to Dracula when she sees him for the first time at the theater. Then later that night, he comes out and rapes her. She dies and becomes a vampire. Lucy is only on screen for a couple of minutes. Mina also has little screen time and has no autonomy. The men are the only ones who act. The women are only important because they are why the women act to gain the heroic ending. They are only as important as the male gaze allows them to be. In the 1992 film Bram Stoker's Dracula, the portrayal of the vampire shifts because of the increased importance of the female viewer. The vampire figure is again used to express sexual desire, but in this portrayal, that desire is shown to be more acceptable, and even a valid outlet for female sexuality. Whereas before he was a monster and the essence of evil, in this movie Dracula is shown as a sympathetic Byronic hero. Like the Byronic hero, Dracula is portrayed as mysterious, wounded, and affectionate, making him seem more human. He is humanized and loses some of the monstrous qualities that consumes previous adaptations of the vampire, such as this Dracula is able to go out in sunlight. However human he may seem, the unnaturalness of Dracula's character is not completely lost. When he is literally raping Lucy and sucking her blood, he is in fact an animal. He is transformed into a wolf penetrating Lucy on screen. In this version of the vampire story, Dracula is given a tragic past where his true love died and he committed himself to evil because of it. Hundreds of years later, he meets his love interest reincarnated in Mina. His love for her overcomes his desire for blood. This softens him, creating a sympathetic hero for the audience to support. By making the humanized version of Dracula for female characters, the female viewer is able to desire Dracula more openly as well. The movie is geared towards a female audience, showing Dracula in a more romantic light. Female desire is shown to be more openly expressed when Mina and Lucy talk to one another, but it is still generally suppressed because this movie is supposed to take place during the Victorian time period. Lucy is shown as completely unnatural because she desires any and all men, sexually and romantically. She pursues men and toys with them. Because of this explicit pursuit of desire and sex, Lucy is again the first target of the vampire. Mina, however, is shown to struggle with her unnatural desire. She falls in love with Dracula and longs for him after she has had sex with her husband. When the men are stabbing Lucy with the phallic redemptive stake, Dracula comes and visits Mina in her bed. He appears under her sheets, right on top of her, straddling her. They declare their love for each other, and Mina asks to become a vampire so that she can spend the rest of her life with him. This differs from all prior adaptations. Instead of a rape scene, it is a consensual love that transcends all boundaries in a romantic fashion. Her desire for Dracula is less of an evil forbidden desire and more of an attractive alternative to the boring, normal human love and sex. This development of human sexuality and the ability to express desire is a direct result of the target audience, towards which the movie is geared. 
The female gaze expressed through Mina is used to view Dracula as an attractive sexual figure instead of one of horror. So we're just going to focus on the book Twilight, but I do have pictures from the movie. In the book Twilight, the fictional vampire figure has made a complete transformation in that the vampire story becomes one of tolerance and acceptance. The vampire is no longer a way to express unnatural desire because it is not unnatural anymore. It is simply an alternative method of expressing desire. In Meyer's portrayal of the vampire through Edward, he is an even more suitable way of expressing sexuality than with normal males. He is a complete Byronic hero. He is shaped by the female gaze, becoming an idealized romantic figure. He is shown trying to access his humanity and acting on it. He is no longer driven by the animalistic impulse to feed on humans, although it still lingers. Edward is also humanized by the fact that he can go out during the daytime, he does not sleep in a coffin, and crucifixes or holy relics do not trouble him. He is a complete hero, and even more so when he falls in love with a human. The readership gets to access his humanity through his love interest's eyes. He becomes the most desirable male in the universe because he is gorgeous, perfect, eternal, loving, caring, smart, and devoted to one girl. Conventional masculine desire is shown to be pale in comparison to the perfection that Edward brings. The human males are no longer the center or the hero of the novel. Female desire is much more accepted in this novel because it is told from the perspective of a girl, Bella, who desires Edward. This allows the female reader to place herself in Bella's shoes. Bella is a stand-in character with no detectable personality or desires outside of her obsession with Edward. Her desire for Edward fills Bella's whole life and consumes the meaning of her existence. Bella is a void that the reader is able to fill so that they can desire Edward just as much as she does. In this book, the female gaze is accessed in its entirety because the male gaze is almost ignored. Instead of the women being the only characters who are objectified, now the male characters are objectified. Edward is described to the utmost detail, detailing the smell of his breath, his hair, pectorals, arms, skin, eyes, mouth, hands, teeth, everything. He is reduced to be seen purely on a desirable level, as women were before. This does not mean, however, that the women portrayed in Twilight are healthy, or complete, or human, even. The vampire figure transforms from an evil monster to a sympathetic Byronic hero who becomes desirable in himself. The human male desire begins as a benchmark for normal and suitable desire that is active and heroic, but they end up as pathetic and passionless compared to the attractive other vampire desire. Because sexuality has become so open in modern day-to-day -day life, Ordinary male sexuality is not as exciting as it was when it was suppressed and hidden. Now the unknown, forbidden sexual desire of a Byronic hero is much more attractive. The female desire transformed along with the changing views of sexuality. As sexuality became more normative, female desire was able to be expressed and therefore it became more active. Whereas before the male gaze created the heroic male and a damsel in distress narrative through the vampire story, today the vampire figure has become a fulfillment of the female fantasy of an extraordinary love story. The transformation of the vampire figure evolves alongside the altering portrayal of the human male and female characters, who are stand-ins for the audience, making them all linked. But never necessarily healthy or reflective of reality. And that's it. Hopefully this was helpful or something. Hopefully there wasn't too much background noise.